Isaiah chapter 63, we'll be starting in verse 7 this morning. Uh, You might have noticed that uh, here with fall kickoff, we're doing things just slightly differently this morning. We have decided, I know this is a big change, that we're going to do announcements at the end of the service. Uh, So often uh, as we're running late, it's hard to hear the announcements when we we get to church and then we ask you to go sign up for something and then we sing and then we preach and then we ask you to remember for a whole hour or what you were going to sign up for, and well, we just thought it might be easier to do announcements at the end of the service. So you'll notice then that uh, when we're done and we do our closing song, we'll uh, all sit back down and do announcements briefly, and that's going to be our new plan for the coming weeks. But I just thought I'd let you know now so that you weren't like, am I supposed to be standing? Am I supposed to be sitting? What in the world is going on? That's how we're doing it. Isaiah chapter 63. Well, you've probably heard the phrase, back in the good old days. When you hear the phrase, the good old days, well, I don't know what it makes you think of. It makes me think of a grandfather who sits their grandchild down over their knee and begins to talk to them about when I was your age, back in the good old days, and I had to walk to school five miles each way, going in the snow, and did I tell you that both directions were uphill? You don't know what it's like back in the good old days. But did you know that the Bible talks about the good old days? Twice here in the passage we're going to be looking at, Isaiah 63, 7 to 14, we're going to see the phrase, the days of old. And the good old days that Isaiah describes in this passage are the days when God did incredible things on behalf of his people. It's important for us to remember the powerful ways that God has worked in our lives. That's why today's message is titled, The Faith-Building Power of Spiritual Memory. You don't have to be old to have spiritual memory. I remember the first time that I came back from college to a Christmas party with some of my friends from high school, and we were sitting around the room talking about all the things that God had done in our life through our high school youth group. God had done some powerful things. I remember sitting there, I was about 20 years old, and I remember thinking, is this what old people do? Is this what I'm going to be doing for the rest of my life? Just sitting and talking about all the ways things used to be awesome? But the good news is that God has done some incredible and awesome things in our lives. And we can remember the incredible things God has done. Do you have an important, impactful memory of something God has done in your life? Maybe it was at camp. Maybe it was at a conference. Maybe it was a time when you heard a powerful message or a song that just greatly stirred your soul. It's good to call those moments and those memories to mind. And that's what Isaiah is going to do here in the middle of Isaiah chapter 63. Now, we're diving into the middle of this section of Isaiah. We've been walking our way through the book of Isaiah. And we're nearing the completion. Just five more messages in Isaiah after this week. But Isaiah could have realistically ended his book after verse 6 of this 63rd chapter. I mean, God has just driven evil completely out of the new creation. That's what happened last week in the first six verses of chapter 63. Like, the new creation is here. The old things that polluted the old world are gone, and we could just say it's all wrapped up now, and everything's as it should be. But Isaiah's not quite done. He pivots here because he has something else that he wants to do before he wraps up his book. And before the new creation can be celebrated in its fullness, Isaiah wants to pray that God would drive the evil out from in here before he drives the evil away out there so that God's people would be fit and ready to live in the new world that God was creating. And so Isaiah offers a four-part prayer. And we're going to look at this prayer this week and next week. Uh, We're going to focus just on part one this week. Uh, Here are the four parts of his prayer. Actually, he took this outline from Psalm chapter 44 and reworked it for his own purpose. But the four parts of his prayer, first, he begins by remembering God's past work. 
Then he'll shift into complaining about the present hardship, confessing sin, and requesting for God to intervene. But notice, before he complains, before he confesses, before he requests God to do anything, he begins by remembering what God has done. Why does he do that? It's as though he's saying, God, I know what you've done before, so I believe that it can happen again. Here's our main point this morning. Recounting God's past work gives us resolve to request that God repeat his glorious realities in our lives now. Or put more simply, God, you've done it before. Do it again. Uh, God, what you've done before, since you are the same God, you can do again in our lives. And maybe this morning you're walking in here and you need God to do something powerful, something great in your life. Maybe you're here this morning and you're really struggling with something. There's been something that's happened in your life. And you're like, God, I need you to show that same power that I experienced in this pivotal moment in my life right now. Again, and the good news is that we serve the same God with the same power who can accomplish the same great things again And so this morning we're going to unpack this first part of Isaiah's prayer, remembering God's past work. We're going to uh, unpack it by asking and answering three questions. And the first question is this, uh, what do we remember? And verses 7 to 9 answer this question. Let's look at those three verses. I will recount the steadfast love of the Lord, the praises of the Lord, according to all that the Lord has granted us and the great goodness to the house of Israel, that he has granted them according to his compassion, according to the abundance of his steadfast love. For he said, surely they are my people, children who will not deal falsely. And he became their savior. In all their affliction, he was afflicted, and the angel of his presence saved them. In his love and in his pity, he remembered them. He lifted them up and carried them all the days of old. So Isaiah begins by recounting these great ways that God has worked in the past for his people. But like any good Israelite boy or girl would do, if, if they were asked, when did God powerfully work on behalf of his people in the past, they would have the same answer. They would be like, there was one specific time in our national past as the nation of Israel when God powerfully worked. And so if you said, hey, Isaiah, when is that time when God powerfully worked? He'd be like, the Exodus. The Exodus, when God pulled his people out from slavery in Egypt, that was the pivotal time. That was the big moment, the grandiose spiritual memory that they had of God working on behalf of his people Isaiah is remembering God's relationship, establishing love. What I want you to see from these verses that we just looked at are all the ways that Isaiah specifically includes little callbacks to the Exodus. So there are phrases here that Isaiah is pulling right from the book of Exodus because he's saying, God, I want you to remember what you did back then. Let me give you four examples. Uh, Starting in verse 8, verse 8. He said, surely they are my people. What's the call back to Exodus? It's calling us back to Exodus chapter 4, verse 22. And here's what Exodus 4.22 says. Then you shall say to Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, Israel is my firstborn son. Who is the nation of Israel to God? They are in such a special relationship. They are his people. It's as though he's adopted them into his family. The next call back, verse 9. In all their affliction, He was afflicted. Notice what happened in Exodus chapter 3. Then the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt, and I have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land. Now, I love that. God's like, I saw the pain you were going through. And maybe this morning you need to know that we have a God who sees the pain we're going through. What does it say next in verse 9? He redeemed them. That word redeemed is specifically pulled from the song that Moses led the people in singing after they walked through the Red Sea. And here's what it says in Exodus chapter 15 and verse 13. You have led them in your steadfast love, the people whom you have redeemed. You have guided them by your strength to your holy abode. One last one of verse 9. Did you see? He lifted them up and carried them all the days of old. What did God do in the good old days? He carried his people. Well, this is 
pulled from Exodus chapter 19 and verse 4. You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you, carried you on eagles' wings, and brought you to myself. Isaiah is highlighting all the ways that God worked in the past. And what's he saying? He's saying God gave them compassion. God became their savior. Why is he saying this? Because in the past, when life got hard, God saved his people. So in the present, when life is hard, we can trust that God will again save his people. Now notice this. The physical reality of salvation, right? Pulling people out of slavery, pulling people out of uh, unhealthy relationships in Egypt. They were a preview and a picture of ultimate spiritual salvation, the rescue from sin and death and hell. And so God's saving in the past is a picture of the ultimate salvation that God will do. But we can trust and have hope that the God who has saved then will save now as we are being saved on the path toward heaven. Why did God save his people? Well, it tells us right here in the text in verse 7, according to the abundance of his steadfast love, God loved his people so much that he got involved in their lives. The question we tend to ask when things go wrong in our lives is, doesn't God love me? Why would God let these things happen? And the answer is God deeply loves his people. He loves his people so much, the text tells us here, that he let himself feel in love and empathy what his people are feeling. And now it's interesting because theologians teach us this glorious truth about God that we don't often talk about in church, but it's this truth called divine impassibility. You're like, okay, big word alert, pastor. What in the world is that? Okay, uh, divine impassibility. Here's a quick definition. Divine impassibility is God does not experience pain or pleasure from the actions of another being. You're like, okay, explain that. Okay, here's what's going on. Like, we all believe God's all-powerful, right? So if God is all-powerful, he cannot be impacted or affected by another power. So if my good works or my sin affected God, as in forced a certain reaction from God, then I would have power over God by what I do or don't do. But since God in his eternal being cannot be impacted by any person or being, or he wouldn't be all-powerful, right? There has to be someone who is not impacted by what anyone else does or doesn't do. Then what I do or don't do can't affect God. So that's a pretty cool theological truth. God is impassable. But, but, note this. God voluntarily suspends his impassibility in his relationship with us. He loves us so much that he chooses to feel, even though he doesn't have to feel. God could sit up in heaven and be like, I got everything I could ever want. I got streets of gold. I've got mansions. I've got the perfect relationship within the Trinity. I don't don't need any of this human drama. But God chooses to feel what we feel because he loves us. The world says, where is your God? How could your loving God let these things happen? And to that we answer, our God is right here. He is feeling what we feel because he loves us and he is coming down to rescue us. I love Isaiah's boldness. When life gets hard, he recounts to God all the ways that God has worked in the past. Now think about that. Isaiah's not telling God the ways that God worked in the past because God forgot. God didn't wake up one morning and be like, hey, what did I do a few thousand years ago? Like God is all-knowing, right? He's not like us. There comes a time in our lives where we start chugging prune juice and taking memory pills because we can't even remember what we had for breakfast each morning. But God isn't like that. God knows everything. So why is Isaiah recounting to God the things that God has done? Not because God forgot, but because we forget. 
We get so caught up in the pain of our circumstance that we forget the power of our God and what he's done in the past. And so we recount to God what he's done so that we can strengthen our faith in the God who does such things. And Isaiah is saying, you are the same God who did these incredible things. Guys, this is so anti-cultural. When we face a problem, our culture tells us, here's what you need to do. You need to come up with an action plan to fix this. And you need to hustle and scrape together all the uh, resources and the power you can muster to get through this situation. And yet, we have a better option. We can, in the midst of our culture that says, figure it out for yourself, make a radical declaration of dependence on God. We can rush to God and say, you are the only one with the power to intervene in this situation. That's why the famous hymn writer penned these words, oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. And we can come to God and say, God, you alone have the power to intervene in this situation. What did Isaiah do in approaching God? He recalled his past work. You can do that in two ways. You can rehearse the ways that God has worked in the past by sharing the stories written in the scripture of God's faithfulness all through the Old Testament. God, you did this for Moses. God, you did this for David. God, you did this for Daniel. All the ways God worked in the past. Or, or you can recite all the ways God has worked in your own life. Because we have a faithful God who has worked through the generations of the saints in history. And we have a God who has worked in our own personal history. And we can recall either of those, to remember how powerful our God is. Why do we remember? This is our next question. We remember because our sin disrupts our relationship with God. Look at verse 10. Uh, but they rebelled and grieved his Holy Spirit. Therefore he turned to be their enemy and himself fought against them. So Isaiah is talking about the Exodus generation. But you can sense that he's talking about the Exodus generation, not for the Exodus generation, but for his generation. Right? Isaiah is talking to a group of people who are back in the promised land after 70 years of exile. But they're like, we're back in the promised land, but the promised land isn't super awesome. Like all the glories we thought would happen when we were back in the promised land, we're experiencing approximately zero of them. Like why is it not awesome being back here in the land you made for us? Well, because God had put his people back in the land, but the people's hearts were still not returning back to the Lord. Their sin had caused a problem, just as sin caused a problem for the Exodus generation. The people in the Exodus generation rebelled against God. They wanted something other than God. They believed that they could find hope and happiness in something other than God. Right? Isn't that what happened in the Exodus generation? Like the Exodus generation is like, we need to make our own God. So let's take a jewelry collection and we'll melt down all our earrings and our bracelets and we'll make ourselves a golden God. And God looked down from heaven and he's like, that's not awesome. And remember, they like smashed the idol a bits and they had to drink water with the gold idol crushed up in it because God is not excited about our rebellion. See, what happens when we rebel? It tells us right here in the text. They rebelled and grieved his Holy Spirit. The God who need not be impacted by our sin because he is all sufficient in himself chooses to be grieved in his relationship with us. Uh, Paul capitalized on this phrase in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 30. He tells us, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. You can grieve the Holy Spirit of God when you believe that you don't need the power or the presence of God in your life. When you believe that you've got life all figured out for yourself. And so I can do what I want to do to make myself happy. See, here's the thing about sin and grieving God. 
Like, we're pretty much experts at 1 John 1, 9. You guys remember that verse? If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So here's kind of sometimes I think how we view sin. If I sin, I've got 1 John 1, 9 in my back pocket. So I know that I can confess it, and I know that he's going to be faithful and just to forgive it. So I want to do it, and I'm going to do it. And then I'll get around to confessing it later. And not a thought is given to how our sin grieves the Holy Spirit of God who indwells us. Because we care more about pleasing ourselves than living for the God who is inside of us. But what happens when we grieve the Holy Spirit of God? When we grieve the Holy Spirit of God and we reject God and live in rebellion to God's ways, life can get hard for us. See, when we reject and rebel against God, things might not work out the way that we've planned. And God isn't on your team when you discard him. He's not an impersonal force that you can use to your own benefit and then throw away. If you aren't following after God, if you've rejected God, don't be surprised when God begins working against you. Here's what God says in Hosea chapter 2 and verse 6. Speaking of the nation of Israel in female pronouns, he says, therefore I'll hedge up her way with thorns, and I will build a wall against her so that she cannot find her paths. God's like, you want to work against me? I'm going to put some obstacles in your way. And maybe you're thinking, man, life feels like it's one obstacle after the next, after the next. And God's like, well, yeah, it is, because I put those obstacles there. Why does God put those obstacles there? Because he's like, I want to put a hedge in your way. So you'll be like, maybe I should stop going that way and start going a different way. Did you know that the word Repent in Hebrew literally means to turn around and go the other direction. God's like, I want you to repent, turn around and stop going your way and start going my way. And so I'm going to put hedges in your way. God is so opposed to sin that he fights against sinners. Did you see it here in verse 10? And calls himself the enemy of sinners. See, God's not super into this like love the sinner, hate the sin type of mentality. God's into, I see you as a whole person and your choices define who you are. And if you choose to be my enemy, well, check out how I treat my enemies. I put obstacles in the way of my enemies so that my enemies will repent and hopefully relent and bow the knee and become my friends. See, all of this is pointing back to Genesis chapter six, two key words in this verse, point us back to Genesis chapter 6, the word spirit, talking about the Holy Spirit and the word grieve. Notice what it says in Genesis 6, 5. The Lord saw that the wickedness of humanity was great in the earth, and that every intention of the thoughts of people were only evil continually. And the Lord regretted that he had made people on the earth, and it grieved him. To his heart. When we grieve the Holy Spirit, what does it look like? It looks like God grieving that He even made us. This Genesis chapter 6 is right before He sent the flood in the days of Noah, and He looks down from heaven, and He's like, Oh my goodness, this thing has gotten off track. And it was so evil and so unrelenting that He thought, You know what? It would be better if these people had never been created at all. And then check out what God said in Genesis 6, verse 3. Then the Lord said, My spirit shall not abide in humanity forever, for he is flesh. His days shall be 120 years. Here's what God's saying. People are so messed up that I'm not going to let my Holy Spirit remain in them. My presence will not be with them. See, see, you got to understand this. God's power gets worked through God's presence. And so when hard things happen in our life, we want God's power. And to get God's power, we need God's presence. And so God is looking down right before the days of Noah when he's going to send the flood. And he's like, my presence isn't going to be with people forever because they're so messed up. He's like, I'm going to put a time limit on how long my spirit will be around because we can't tolerate all the nonsense that's here on the earth. 
And when you lose the presence of God, you lose the power of God. But here's what I want you to see. I want you to see that what was lost can be regained. See, in the Old Testament, God's people could grieve the Lord and lose the presence of God. But in the New Testament, the Holy Spirit stays with the people of God permanently and forever. And you're like, what changed? And the answer is Jesus changed. So check this out. Uh, Genesis chapter 6 for people living around the time of Jesus, got translated from Hebrew into Greek. And when it says, my spirit will not remain with people forever, they use the Greek verb katamene, katamene, to remain. My spirit will not katamene with people forever. Why do I say that? Because I want you to see what the Apostle John says when he writes his gospel. And in the gospel of John, right when John was baptizing Jesus, it says, John bore witness. I saw the Holy Spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and it amenane on Jesus. My spirit will not katamene on people, but it will amenain on Jesus. Same word. Why? Because what was lost because of our sin was regained because of our Savior. On the perfect one, the Spirit remains. And so if we are in Jesus Christ, the presence of God remains and the power of God remains. And so the greatest spiritual memory that the people of Israel had in the Old Testament was we look back to what God has done in the Exodus, but the Spirit comes and the Spirit goes, and we hope the Spirit will come back and do what God had done in the Exodus. But now we have a new and greater spiritual memory. We need not look back to the Exodus, but we look back to the new Exodus and what Jesus Christ has done on the cross. And we see that Jesus has made a way for the Holy Spirit to be with us forever. So there is no valley that we will walk through. There is no circumstance we will face. There is no illness we will battle where God's presence will not remain to show his power in our lives because the presence of God does not depend on our righteousness to remain with us. The presence of God remains with us because of the righteousness of Jesus Christ that was given in our place. And so if you are in him, the spirit remains. If you are in Jesus, the power is still available. We recall the work of Jesus and say, Lord, would you do it again? Would you do it again? Well, for what purpose do we remember? This is our third and final question. We remember Because we want God to repeat his great work in our lives. Look at these last verses. Starting in verse 11. Then God remembered the days of old of Moses and his people. Where is he who brought them up out of the sea with the shepherds of his flock? Where is he who put in the midst of them his Holy Spirit, who caused his glorious arm to go at the right hand of Moses, who divided the waters before them to make for himself an everlasting name, who led them through the depths, Like a horse in the desert, they didn't stumble. Like livestock that go down into the valley, the Spirit of God gave them rest. So you led your people to make for yourself a glorious name. Two questions control this section. It's really the same question. The same three words begin both questions. You see them there in verse 11. Where is he? Where is he? Like, where is the God who did these things in the past? Isn't that the question we ask when life gets hard? Where are you, God? And here's what Isaiah is saying. God's power hasn't changed. Uh, God's character hasn't changed. The same God can do the same things in our generation The same God can do the same things in our life. Our obedience might have waned. Our faith might be weakened. But our faith can be renewed and God can do it again as we return to him. The presence of God is still within us through the Holy Spirit. Because if we are in Christ... No matter 
how weak our faith grows. If you are in Christ, you cannot be unsealed. If you are in Christ, you cannot be unchosen before the foundations of the world. If you are in Christ, you cannot be adopted as a child into God's family. If you are in Christ, his power remains and can be worked again on your behalf. So when Isaiah asks the question, where is he? We can confidently answer, in Jesus Christ, he is indwelling me. In Jesus Christ, he is here with me. And Isaiah recalls one specific part of the Exodus to point out God's faithfulness. Did you see it there in verse 12? It says, uh, where's the one who divided the waters? Now, back in the ancient Near East, water was a pretty scary thing. Water was considered a place of chaos. The waves could whip up and capsize your vessel. There were all kinds of scary creatures that lived beneath the surface of the water that they couldn't define. And what did God say to his people that he was going to do at the Red Sea in the midst of this chaotic water? He's like, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to push the waters back and you're going to walk through the depths. And then when we think about that, we think about, okay, cool. Like there was water on both sides and they walked on the sand. But I want you to think about it from their perspective. Like where did they walk? They literally walked on the floor of the sea. Who in that generation had seen the floor of the sea? Nobody, right? Like they didn't have scuba diving equipment that you would just kind of snorkel down there and be like, oh, look, there's sand on the bottom here. Like the sea was just this deep pit to them and they had no idea what could possibly be on the bottom. The depth of the sea was a scary place. And yet they served a God who walks with them through the valley of the shadow of death. And so they were walking on each side. Now, I kind of wonder what it was like with the water on each side. They, you know, I, I kind of wonder if there were fish that they could see, right? Like you were walking by, you know, the hallway in the aquarium, and like the fish cannot go through the glass. It's like, well, the fish can't go through this wall of water here because it's stopped, and God's hands are holding it back, and like this fish isn't going to come flopping onto the sand where I'm walking. Like, I just wonder what that was like. But here's the thing. They were walking through the scariest place that they could possibly imagine in the world. And God was leading them all the way. And maybe this morning you're walking through the scariest place you can imagine. Maybe this morning you're walking through the scariness of a horrific health diagnosis and you have no idea where it's going. Maybe this morning you're walking through the scariness of relational turmoil and you have no idea how it's going to end. Maybe this morning you're walking through the scariness of financial uncertainty and you're not quite sure how you're going to make your budget work. But the answer to every problem we face is that our God walks with us. And notice what it says, like a horse in the desert, they didn't stumble. Like, I love that. They're walking in the scariest place and God's like, you're galloping like you're on this gallant war horse, like your path is so firm. Like if I'm walking on the bottom of the sea, I think I'm just kind of tiptoeing like I hope I don't accidentally reach out and touch the water and cause the whole thing to collapse on me because that's going to go really super bad. And God takes his people in victory through the scariest place they could ever imagine being. Why does he do it? Verse 14 tells us that there's two reasons God does this for his people. And the first reason, do you see it? The Spirit of the Lord gave them rest. When you're facing a hard time in life, what you really want is some peace. You just want some calm, and you want some rest. Isn't that why Jesus said, come to me all you who are weary and heavy laden and I will give you rest. Heaven, the new creation, is defined for us as a place of rest. Listen to what it says in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 9. So then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever has entered God's rest rest from their works just as God did from his. Like what makes heaven so awesome? What makes eternity so wonderful? We get rest. 
there will come an existence where we don't have to worry about how we're going to continue staying alive. There will be a being in the presence of God, a state of being in the presence of God, where we're not worried about how we're going to continue to be in the presence of God. Like we just get rest and all is made right and all is good and it's that way forever and nothing can change it. And that's rest. And the good news is that the God who is leading us to rest is giving us rest on the journey home as we trust in him that the one who has safely secured the new creation for us will safely bring us to the new creation he has made. And the second reason he does that, the very last phrase, to make for yourself a glorious name. God's glory is seen through his character, his characteristics and his attributes. So when we see the character, the characteristics and the attributes of God, and when we experience them working on our behalf in our life, it causes us to worship him for who he is. God, I've seen your goodness. God, I've seen your power. God, I've seen your strength. And I worship you for who you are. See, as human beings, we were designed to worship. So often we give our worship to other things, to other gods. But we will never find our true rest until there is true worship. When we give ourselves fully to the worship of God forever. And God says this is what I'm doing for you. I am walking you through the seasons of life so that you can see my power. And when the seasons of life feel overwhelming, remember my power in the past so that you can have confidence in my power in the present. Our God has the power to bring us safely home to the rest he's created for us. Well, let's take a moment and pray. Maybe there's a situation in your life that you would want to say, Lord, I need your power. I need your power in my life because of this situation that I'm facing. I need your power in my life because of this hard time I'm going through. But God, I remember the ways you've worked in my life. I remember the ways you've worked in the history of your people. Maybe this morning there's a specific memory you can cling to for a specific trial you're going through so that you can believe that our God, our faithful God, will do it again. Show his power again in your life. God, would you show us a certain memory of how you've worked in the past that we can cling to in the present. We give you what we're going through. We run to you in prayer. And we ask that you would be the one to show your power in our life because your faithfulness is great. We pray this in Jesus' name.